Hey everyone, this is Ben Botkin here. Today I want to take a look at a new library by Orchestral Tools. Uh, this is the Agudisman Violin, which was created in collaboration with violinist Alexi Agudisman. So what I want to do today is basically take a look at this library. This is not a comprehensive walkthrough. I'm not going to talk about every feature, but I'm particularly interested in the question, what is the function of this library for a professional composer? How do I imagine I will be using it in my template alongside my other tools? And also I want to uh, show exactly how I'm using this violin in this demo that I wrote. So I'll start by playing the demo that I wrote for the library, which is called Elementary Perceivers. Yes, it is Sherlockian. So let's take a listen. <laughs> Alrighty, so let's talk about this one. First off, I want to talk about something that I consider basically the elephant in the room, and that is a question that I struggle with at times, and that is basically what is a sampled solo string library good for at a professional level? Because when you create a piece of music with samples, unless you're doing what is genuinely a mock-up to show to give someone an idea for what the final version will sound like after it's recorded with live instruments, unless you're doing that, basically every piece of music you write has to sound finished. You're producing a finished version and that has to sound believable. It has to sound musical. It has to sound, well, real, or at least it has to sound real to the people who are listening to it. It has to sound professional in short. Now there's a threshold, um, basically in all sample libraries and where this threshold is, is gonna depend on your mock-up skills, the goals of the project, budget, time, many factors. But basically that the, the question behind the threshold is at what point is it not worth it to work on something with samples when you could just record it with a, a real instrument? And inversely, you would say, at what point is it not worth it to record with a live instrument or a live ensemble? Because you can just do it with samples. Samples are usually cheaper, usually faster, not always. And we'll talk about that when it comes to sampled violins. When it comes to something like a 60 piece orchestra doing uh, basic spiccatos or sustains or something like that, why would you spend all the time and the money and the resources on recording it with a live orchestra when samples can do that exact thing just fine? And in some cases even better because the sample libraries may be really focused on providing an especially good like short sound or especially um, you know specialized sustains. So, but when it comes to something like a solo instrument, it's not that expensive to record only one of them. And so, in my opinion, in most cases, it's solo violin, so solo string sample libraries are kind of right at the edge of that threshold because. They're so hard to get sounding realistic. It's like holding holding water in your hand. You know, there's there's just so much nuance behind a string instrument uh, to bring it to a point of being believable. I mean, there's just such expressive, fluid, deep instruments. They're so hard to capture. They're so hard to sample. And then even if uh, you have a library that can capture so many nuances of the instrument, then you have to know how to control them and how to use them. And that's that itself can be a ton of work. So in many cases, I just don't write for solo uh, strings 
when it comes to samples, unless it's some background element, I will, uh, I will either use a different instrument that can carry a featured role well, or uh, it'll just mean recording a live musician. Um, like for example, I, I, uh, I did a demo for the uh, Embertones um, Joshua Bell violin a few years ago, and it's one of the best sampled solo violins there is. And, but to get it basically to the point where it sounded as realistic as all of my other instruments, it was a ton of work. It was so much work to get it sounding that good. And I have basically not used that instrument again since, even though it's an amazing instrument, just because for my purposes, it takes so much work to get it to like the basically real sounding threshold that it has to be at for you know my production goals. Uh, one other thing I want to say about kind of this violence, you know, this, this threshold is, and here's just a, a general point about getting a mock-up to sound real, getting sample instruments to sound real. Let's say with your instruments, you can get your, your uh, with most of your instruments, you can get the realism factor, the believability factor to about 90, sounds about 90% good. All right. Well, if you have a featured element that sounds only 80% good, it kind of drags everything down because your ear is going to follow that featured element. It's going to follow the melody. It's going to follow the soloist. And that's one of the reasons why it's, it's such a popular practice and such a good idea to record soloists and, com and uh, combine them with sample, sample libraries because the soloist, if it's 100% you know, realistic and believable, it can kind of pull everything in the background up with it. But it's a very bad idea if like the rest of your orchestration sounds 90% good and you have a featured instrument that you can only get sounding 80% good, it's really a pretty bad virtual orchestration idea to use that as your featured instrument. Maybe in the background, maybe where it won't be noticed. Um, but one of the, the biggest things in virtual instruments is what well, I might call this 10% rule. Don't use an element that's 10% less realistic than everything else that you're doing because it will drag it down unless maybe it's really buried in the background. Um, but things like string runs, unless I have a very good, um, basically pre-recorded string run, I typically don't have string runs in my pieces of music for that very reason. It's just I can't get them sounding as good as everything else that I do. So I don't do them. So why on earth would you use a sampled violin? Right? There's the question, and that leads us to this library. When uh, Orchestral Tools reached out to me recently and said, hey, would you like to do a demo for us? It's for a solo violin library. I was like, oh, fun. These are the best. You know, sarcasm. Because um, they take, I think this is the fourth solo violin demo that I've done uh, before. And they almost always take the most work. So I was I was skeptical, but they sent it to me and I took I took a play, uh, I I played around with it and I thought ah this is very interesting, it can do some stuff that um, some of my other libraries cannot do, but also um, I see this as being very functional, not just when I'm trying to write something in a kind of um, a gypsy kind of Sherlock Holmes esque track, but there's some effects, there's some sounds, there's some samples that. Uh, I can definitely see uh, being very useful. So let's now go ahead and start to talk about this, this piece of music. I want to, here's, here's, the, uh, here's the entire piece of music that I have here, green. Everything in green up here is the uh, Agudisman violin. And we've got a, got a few other things to build out the arrangement. Um, let's focus in on how I'm using a Goodisman in this track. And to start on that, I'm going to solo just the Goodisman tracks and, um, let's put, now let's open them, open them externally. There we go. Let's listen to just those on their own and you can hear what it sounds like without being hidden behind any other instruments. And by the way, there's very little, I have a little bit uh, of effects and, uh, and stuff on my, on my, um, Stereo master, but not much. So this is very close to the out of the box sound.
for some reason that last note, which is like a, a little gliss, is not working. And why is it not working? I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll deal. It's just a little uh, zip, little glissando effect. Um, maybe I'll deal with that later. Not a priority for this video. It's a nice effect, but it's not. Uh, it's not a priority. Um, some people wondered on the VI Control forum when they heard this track, uh, how long did this take to create? And the answer is uh, about one day. I received the library on a Friday afternoon, played with it for an hour or two, and then the next Monday. Uh, I spent most of the day uh, finishing it up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open the violin standard articulations. Something you may have noticed as you looked at the notes. There is not a lot of fluid legato stuff happening at all. In fact, there is only one legato transition in this entire track. Everything else is just a... a created with a combination of long and short notes. So how I created this was, first off, I opened up the library. The first thing I did, well, where is it? Here we go. I opened it up and I played with the legatos. And to be honest, at least for the beta, I haven't played with them in the uh, final release. They were not particularly compelling to me, but I didn't really, I didn't really open this, I, I wasn't really intrigued by the library because of the legatos. Um, I thought, you know, what can I do with the effects, the shorts, the longs, it's uh, samples that have aggression and bite to them, because that's kind of the promise of a library like this, right? It's It's got a very um, gritty sound. So I was instantly attracted to the Marcados. Uh, let's see, what, what, what's the main one I use? There we go, yeah, the Marcado accented uh, Gitano, or Gitano, not sure how you pronounce that. Let's see here. What do I have going on? I'll go to that guy. What I did is basically I just played with this single articulation. Or whatever. And basically, I improv the melody with the patch that I thought was most interesting and most uh, inspiring to play. So like I said, there are other videos that will talk about the legatos. I'm not, I, don't, I may not even get into that today because that's not what intrigued me about the function of this library. Because kind of whenever you get to legato territory for solo strings, you kind of hit that threshold that I mentioned in the beginning, which is, when is it actually worth it to use a sampled instrument uh, versus getting something real? And is it going to sound as good as everything else? So I'm not even going there in this video. You can uh, listen to some of the, or maybe I will at the end, but you can get uh, some previews of the legato patches in some other videos. Um, I basically, so I basically I improv this piece with the patch that, uh, the articulation I enjoyed the most. And then I went through, cleaned it up, and replaced the notes in that performance with shorter articulations when they should be shorter. Uh, change it to a different effect when I wanted to use a different effect. And why would you not? When you have so many articulations, why would you not throw in an accented one in somewhere? Why would you not throw in a swell? Why would you not throw in a crescendo? Why would you not throw in a couple pizzicatos? Um, you know, virtuoso violinists, We'll sometimes do that in the middle of uh, in the middle of a track when they have enough time to switch from bowing to plucking. Uh, it'll sometimes there'll be a few of those in there. So basically, let's look at just and also you will see most of the dynamics. Oh wait, okay. Let me turn off right now. The colors were focused on. Part, I'm going to switch to focus on velocity. You can see I'm also not doing a bunch of fancy stuff with the mod wheel uh, or expression or uh, volume automation. I'm doing a little bit, but not tons. Most of what I'm doing is just with velocity. And because this is a melody made up of a bunch of short and shorter notes, this, this works. So... Let me open this up. Take a look at the key switches down here. Uh, I'll probably open it up in its own window. So you can see the key switches 
I know key, key switches can be a bear to deal with, but it, it really is kind of worth it for something like this. Another question I saw in the VI control forum about this li uh, library was how playable is this library? And unless you're going to use the legatos and you really like how they sound. Oh, wait a second. Interesting. I think I think in the beta that I had that I didn't have any like portamento legatas. Actually, I wanted one. I was like, oh, I want one for this one thing. Oh well. Um, in my opinion, when when it comes to how I'm going to use this library, I am not expecting this to be something I can just play in and then it's good to go. But I am going to be willing on certain occasions to do some of the work to swap out the right length note with the right length articulation. It takes a little work, uh, but it doesn't actually take that much work. I'm not like as you see, I'm not having to do a ton of stuff in the um, you know with CC or automation to fudge transitions, and that's a lot of the work when it comes to legato transitions going from one to the next, getting them to not sound sucky or swoopy or bumpy um, with a lot of libraries. So. It's just, let's take a look at the articulations as they switch. There's our like auto, one transition. Like staccato. Using the articulations that you have provided by a library is very important. You know, so much of realism is, I mean, you're, the instrumentalist is going to play in different ways and play at different note lengths and play with different attacks. And uh, that's other, one other thing I want to say. Legatos uh, get a lot of the attention in marketing when it comes to the marketing of library. And it makes sense because really good, you know, for the longest time, Good sounding legato. Well, I mean, legatos used to be transitions used to be kind of a, a novelty feature, and then at a certain point, probably 10, 15 years ago, everyone started having legato transitions in between sustained notes, and they would call it true legato. You know, this is not just simulated; this is actually true legato. We actually recorded all those transitionary sounds from note to note, um, and it was kind of the big thing, and it still is a big thing. If you could get it sounding really fluid and natural at different speeds and at different dynamics, then you do have something uh, really special, but you're not going to want to use it in every scenario because even in a real life setting, not all notes are connected. And so when I'm considering a, uh, a lifelike performance, I'm not just thinking about the transitions. I'm thinking about um, attacks, how a note starts, and I'm thinking also about how a note ends. And then, of course, how that note connects or doesn't connect into the next one. But attacks and releases are really just as important as anything else that happens in the middle. And one thing I love ab about this library is that the range of shorts, um, you have some really nice attacks on these on these patches. Right, what do I have going on here? I'm gonna go ahead and close that, close this guy now. Uh, da, 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 da. And you have really aggressive triple F kind of stuff. And that's what it's sometimes hard to find in other libraries. So like the gritty, almost savage aggression in this library is one of the things that I think makes it interesting and, and makes it interesting for coloring other tracks with. Because maybe you have another track and you're trying to make it sound realistic and you don't have a featured violin part, but maybe you want to bring in a little background violin 
effect or a little crescendoed note, well, you could grab one of these and have that in the background and, or add that a little here, a little there, and it can just add a little bit of color and a little bit of uh, vitality to a track that might otherwise be a little bit more stale. So that's one of the ways I see this library being used as a complement to other libraries to bring in color, to bring in effects. And you may notice on this track, I have a few different things going on. I've got basically my main melody, and then I've got a second track, which is the, the main multi-violin, and it is doing kind of some in-between notes. Dun dum bum ba bum bum ba bum bum ba bum bum. These little guys in between. So uh, let's listen to the two together. This is the sort of thing that like a solo, I've heard Isaac Perlman do stuff kind of like this. This might be really a, a, a violin duet kind of thing. This, uh, this one's kind of playing those little in-between notes. Um, and, oh, this is a cool part of this library. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, that's what I want to talk about. I was talking, well, I should, maybe I'll just run through, I'll, uh, run through some of the patches. Uh, go back to the standard articulations. <laughs> Sustain Stratano. Again, I'm probably saying that wrong through the whole track, whole piece. Ooh, that sounds really nice. Almost like a Michael Kamen. Like if you like, if you uh, doubled that with like a violin stain patch. Band of Brothers E. Ooh, soft Jatana. Ooh. Those are even nicer. Oh, those are very nice. I'm getting more interested in this library even as I go. <laughs> so are these are some of the more aggressive ones. I also love how imperfect some of these are. Like uh, the vibrato like gets so intense that it like messes up. I don't know if it actually counts as messing up in this style though, but it, um, and even some of the notes feel like the intonation almost starts to like go off a little bit when it gets really intense. And I like that, especially when you're adding color and flavor to a pre-existing piece of music. Because that's one of the things that samples are often a little bit uh, short on. Uh, staccatos, we looked at already. I 
pizzicatos are really... Oh, it's a little higher than it goes. Button up glissando. Those like pitch bendy ones, pitch bending notes, I actually find really helpful. Again, just like a little dash here, a little dash there in a track. Uh, it adds something that most of your other samples won't have. Bartok. Oh, these are interesting. With a drill. Short. I love that. It's just like, it's really aggressive and I use some of those. Short. Oh no, I'm not showing you the part of my screen. Rapid legato gitano. Hmm. That's not too bad. Those are better than when I beta baited the library. Actually, that's quite usable. Take back what I said about legatos earlier. Um, I am used. I am playing with them a little bit. Let's sell the rap, rap legato. Interesting. I wonder why it's labeled that way. Why is that called slurred legato gitano when it's not, when it's playphonic? I don't know. I don't know. So that's that's a little bit of what's in here. Just a real quick overview. Um, as you can see in this piece, I have kind of my main violin, my secondary violin, some rhythms, and these are very cool. Uh, but I have a little bit of these um, uh, kind of repetitive uh, repetition fast piazzola. Listen to these guys. Little scratches. Those are great. And they add so much color. Um, and they don't necessarily need to be tonal because everything else is tonal. They can be uh, almost more percussive, which is basically what they are. And for some reason, the, these, cl uh, these klezmer, zip, the gashandos are not playing, and I don't know why. Um... I'm going to reload those real quick. Oh, I'm going to go down here to my, here we go, solo violin, solo violin, standard articulations. Hopefully it works now. Let's see here. There we go. So if I color the effects violin patches yellow, these are scratches. I'm throwing in some of these to fill the gaps just to add a little color, add a little interest. That's basically what they're there for. Uh, violin rhythms. Okay, this is another. This is the part of the library that's very interesting to me, and I think could be very useful in many other contexts, not only music of this style. Uh, and that is the rhythmic patterns. So, it 
doesn't work that well if you have too many notes and they're a little bit off from each other. They have to be really tight. You probably will need to uh, touch up those start times to make sure the repetitions are really tight together. And this BPM I'm working at is a little fast, I think even for... These are really nice. I, in fact, the day after I created this demo, I had uh, a cue for a film that was a totally different style. It was kind of more modern pop kind of orchestra comedy drama thing, but, and I had like a, a drum and drum kit and some piano and strings. And I just wanted something with a little bit of, it uh, came momentum a little bit and just add a little bit of a grungy uh, momentum. So I just had like one one note of one of these. you know, in there underneath some of the other elements. And it added, in my opinion, added a lot. And the uh, director was okay with it. So I guess, I guess he thought so too. Uh, actually, that was a husband, wife, I guess, yeah, team. Anyways. Um, let's see here. All right. So the rhythms, those are very useful. That's one of the things I wanted to talk about in terms of function. Um, so yeah, that that's most of what I have going on here. It's it's just these few tracks. Uh, let's see. I had a few notes on what I wanted to talk about, so this video wouldn't get too long. But it's getting too long anyway. So, um, yeah. So how will I use this library? Well, like I mentioned, I still I'm going to probably hesitate from using most violin libraries in a super featured way, like carrying the melody. Um, I mean, if I want to do something really in this style, this is pretty great. But I, even even then, like if it was like a really featured melody on, you know, a, a game or a, or a film, I still might record that. So in my opinion, I'm going to be using this uh, for little dashes and basically little uh, adding some effects, adding some color, adding some aggression, adding some of those little scratches, some of those little uh, runny sounds. Um, and maybe maybe it's in a more comedic track and maybe there is there is a melody, but it's only for 10 or 12 seconds. And it's just a little snatch of something to kind of add a, add a particular uh, feeling of a certain genre to the track. So I probably won't use it as upfront as this in a lot of my media music that I write, because I mean, I'm rarely asked to write something quite as thematic or upfront with violin in the style, but I can see using the samples that it comes with in a variety of styles and in a variety of contexts, basically to sprinkle around um, these effects, these scratches, these attacks, these nice, really warbly, wobbly, extreme vibratos. I can see using uh, them actually in a number of places to add some realism, to add some color. Um, now, I'll probably talk briefly for those of you who are interested in just kind of what I have in the rest of this track. Um, there's not quite as much going on as it sounds like, in my opinion. Uh, I've got two um, Metropolis Arc 3 piano staccato tracks. Uh, they're really nice, but I have two of them, like twin staccato piano brothers. Um, and everything in here is orchestral tools except for this harpsichord, which is this, the lightweight Spitfire one, which is free or really cheap. I can't remember. Uh, 
I really, really like spit. I really like a uh, harpsichord in orchestral writing. Uh, obviously, you can't use it in many flavors or genres. Uh, I mean, it, it's so evocative of, of certain like medieval, old European feelings that you can't use it everywhere. But it's I love how percussive it is. Uh, it's um, it's such a bright instrument. It's really easy to get sounding good, in my opinion with like string orchestra, actually a lot easier to use in the mid-range, kind of in there, than uh, piano is. Piano is very hard to use in there. So I, I usually use piano at the extreme high and the extreme low ends, but harpsichord, I can kind of help, you know. I can play crashing chords, it can... It can... Um, you can do an ostinato pattern. I can double it with strings. You just can't use it everywhere because it it uh, it evokes so much of a, a period sound. But when I can use it, I love harpsichord. Uh, percussion, some Berlin percussion. Mostly this is tambourines, drumsticks. Let's take a listen to some of this. Claves. You know, fairly standard stuff. Well, this is just our keys. I didn't actually do that. So what do we have? Boom pop. Performing a few functions. I could even clean it up a little. Some of the timing here is not great. But if I was like the pianist and I was playing live to this piece of music, my timing wouldn't probably be great either. I'd probably be a little rushy, a little slow on some parts. But when you throw all the elements together, I don't know. It might sound even better with some parts a little off then everything perfectly quantized or mostly qu or more quantized. Um, with percussion. All right, let's see what else we have. We have our solo violin tracks. We've got our keys. We've got our percussion. There's a cell, cymbal roll in there. Um, I use a little bit of a um, arc three, just kind of to add, I wanted to add a little more weight and fullness than the solo violin has. Uh, there's some repeated, repeated notes. And I could have just used like spiccatos for this. Ooh, that's a little messy. Oh, well, you probably didn't notice it when everything else was going on. <laughs> um, the only truly legato instrument, like legato-y, legato-y instrument I have going on here is a bass clarinet from Berlin Woodwind Soloist 2. And I, I could have cleaned this up more too, also. Uh, I've got a uh, upright bass from LAS, not LASS, but this is this is Berlin's, uh, what's it called? Oh, I just forgot, oh, LA Studios uh, Studio Production Toolkit. Just an upright bass. Doubling the bass note of the piano. And that's where my low end is coming from. Got to have a strong low end. Especially when you have like a really uh, classic pattern, like the oompa. Boom, 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 boom. You got to have a strong bass line. And then something I did that was kind of weird 
uh, is when part two, when you, like our, our Christian, Vivaldi esque crescendo thing happens. Um, I had some. Uh, wait, this isn't Metropolis Arc 3. This is Metropolis Arc 5. I had some. Um, there's some analog synths. I had one open already in this project, and I thought, I'll just use that. Well, that's some low pulse, which is kind of nice. It's bum 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 Here's, what we, here's, here's everything but the violin. Sounds really full. One of the big reasons why it sounds full is because of the voicing. It's pretty spread out. We got stuff happening in our mid range, uh, like harpsichord. We've got a pretty strong uh, bass line reinforced by our piano and our uh, upright bass. And we've got our high end pretty well represented by the piano, but also our uh, tambourine. So this is not that many different instruments going, but it kind of fills the spectrum pretty nicely. And then you just... Oh, the last articulation I did not talk about is the, the neo-electric articulations. There's a handful of them in here. And these are some of the craziest, intensest sounds in this library. Licks. I don't, I don't even know if I know what that is. Ooh, that's nice. That's, that's just so crazy. I love that kind of stuff. Oh, it goes really high. Look at this. It goes all the way up to the highest C on the piano. Wow, that's wild. Uh, sustain soft. These are mod wheel. So that's what I'm using basically to add our intensest moments in this track. And I've got my violin rhythms going. It's just like really, really going. I love how it's not completely clean. <laughs> that's really nice. Um, yeah, that's basically what what's going on in this piece of music. Um, I will also show you what what effects I have going on here. 
just to be uh, just to kind of give you a, a full picture. I have a little bit of ozone elements. Oops. I have a little bit of ozone elements and it's, what is it doing? It is, I'm EQing down around my like 150 range. Um, Cause I often, I often get a little build up there. And I find often if I just dip that range, it's probably partly my monitor, monitoring situation, but I often get a little bit of build up right around here. So I often will dip it a little and it basically never sounds worse when I do that. Uh, I'm dipping the middle a tiny bit, boosting the highs a little bit. Uh, adding a little bit of imaging, a uh, little bit of maximization, not tons because I don't really want to crush um, my high end. This is my streaming. This helps me uh, stream straight to OBS. So that's not an effect. It's not affecting the sound. I have a little bit of over the top, just a little bit to, to add a little bit more aggression and grunge basically to this track. Um, maybe I'll, I'll do a little bit of A and B with it without with it yeah I don't know if it's actually better with it and, and I've got a little bit of east west spaces reverb um there's a lot of dry just a little bit of wet uh, east west studios uh, this is not like a really long this is a pretty short tail well, I mean, compared to some of the other ones. So I think that's all, all, all that I have going on effects-wise. But if I... Oh, better not turn that one off. That'll turn off my... It'll stop capturing. If I turn off everything else, it doesn't sound that different. If I... And this is no effects on anything. That sounds almost the same. Um, and I'm finding kind of more and more, the more I work with instruments dry or just with mic, or, uh, mic positions and just use effects as like a little bit of sparkle, a little bit of shine, maybe adding a little bit of effects to individual tracks. Like you can see here, if I want them to do something uh, specific, Ooh, something's peeking a little bit. Um, I, I, I can usually hear a lot better if I work on things that don't have a ton of effects and only add effects to them while I'm writing if that effect is an important part of its sound. But my stuff is starting to sound more open, more detailed, and then I add maybe a little bit of reverb at the end, a little bit of something at the end just to help it sparkle. But I find the more I'm working actually with fewer effects while I work, the more detail I have in my writing and the more things I'm able to hear. So. There's a little run through of the Agudisman violin. Uh, my personal take is that I will probably use this violin library um, more than a lot of the other ones I have. Um, uh, just because it comes with so many different effects and sp special articulations or cool sustains that add intensity or grittiness that, or uh, imperfection that my other samples don't have. I can totally see myself, um, in fact, I think I wanna play with this after this video is over, <laughs> uh, doubling some of those really nice uh, sustain, like softer sustains with like a full strings, like maybe CSS uh, or something patch. Cause I think it, it could add some really, really uh, nice, nice tone to it. Um, so that I think this is actually probably going to be one of my more useful um, solo violin libraries that I have. In fact, I might actually use it sometimes <laughs> as opposed to a lot of the other ones. Um, how useful it is in your workflow obviously is going to be up to you and your needs. But uh, and if it's worth the price to you, it's on intro price right now. I think until the 9th of February. So at least take a look at it and see if it's something that offers colors, sounds, samples uh, that you want so that you don't have. I think it's a cool little library because I think it is fairly unique uh, and unique things are interesting to me um, because I have, I have quite a few libraries already. There's, there's only so many kind of lukewarm sustains that you need, you know. Um, 
Oh, one other thing I will say, I meant to say, talk about this earlier, but this is just a little tip of mine. You see this little uh, truck up at the top? So I have this little uh, divider feature right there in Cubase. Oh, you can't see it's under my video. Well, it's like right, right like an inch above here. There's a little divider button and it opens, it basically splits my track list and then one will stay at the top and it will, it will uh, stay at the top no matter where I scroll. And usually I have a lot more tracks than this. So like if I, uh, you know, if I open up the, well, you can see on my stick, piano staccatos, I actually have a fair bit of vol volume automation. If I open up all my autom volume automation lanes, um, you know, this will stay at the top. And I, I basically will do this, start an audio track. There's no audio in it. I just use the pencil tool to draw where my bars are. And this, I color them in just to remind me kind of what's happening here. This is my, my intro. This is like verse one. This is verse one. And this is uh, like verse two. I can't remember how I had it. This is this is the next bit. <laughs> and this is the next bit. And then this is the last crescendo. This is the end. And these purple bits, these are like the gaps in between that I want something to fill. Because often I'll have like my main melody. Da 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 da. Wait. Da 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 da. You know, but during that little wait, that gap, I want something to carry the momentum across. So usually it'll be like a B melody, min melody drops out and then a B melody comes in and kind of anticipates or lead us to the, leads us to the next spot. But I like plotting those in here. That way, no matter where I am in my track, I can see, right, I need somebody to like fill that space and provide whatever function it is I want the instruments in that space to fill in that gap. So just having kind of the structure of the piece plotted out a little bit like this and having it like locked to the top so it's always visible, you know, it could, it could even be more minimal than that. You know, I, I find that really helpful. You might find that helpful too. So uh, that's it for this video. It ended up being a lot longer. Oh my goodness, 54 minutes. It ended up being a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. But uh, hopefully you found it interesting or helpful, especially if you're interested in this library. And um, one other thing I will say is uh, I might be producing a MIDI study pack based on this piece at some point, <coughs> uh, which basically gives you access to my MIDI, gives you access to this Cubase project file, and a PDF, study PDF with some composition, orchestration, sample, stration notes. Um, Audio stems, this one at least, will have audio stems so you can you can hear what's going on if you don't have those libraries. And basically it's like a little educational pack to um, where you can you can open it up, you can apply your own libraries to it. If you got the Agudisman violin yourself, if you have it yourself, then you can apply it on here. You can see how I'm using it in detail, move things around. Basically it's just a way to, to, to dig into my composition if you're one of the crazy people who wants to do that and one of the even crazier people who thinks it's worth spending money doing that. Um, so I have a handful of those over at my educational site, Forte Composer Academy, already. I'll probably have one for this piece at some point. So when it when it is available, it'll be down in the uh, video description. And so if you like this video, you want to see others, like and subscribe, because that's what content creators say at the end of their videos. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.